Welcome to part 36 of our series, Secrets of Glessner House. In this installment, we will conclude the exploration of the bathrooms in this house, including the recent restoration of the guest bathroom. We are fortunate to have detailed information on the bathrooms that helps us to understand how they were configured and what they look like. This section of a floor plan dates to 1963, when the house was documented by the Historic American Building Survey. It shows the Glessner's bathroom with the fixtures drawn in. At the top, from left to right, are the bathtub, the foot bath, and the toilet. At bottom right is the wall-mounted sink. This drawing is valuable as it shows the bathrooms were reconfigured from how they appear on the original blueprints. There are two photos of bathrooms in the house, both taken after the Glessners died. This image of their bathroom was taken in 1948 by Robert C. Florian, at the time a photography student at the nearby Institute of Design. It provides valuable information, including how the bathtub and foot bath were built in with tiled sides and the materials used for the toilet seat and legs. We'll see a few other details later on. The second image we have shows the bathroom shared by George Glessner and the occupants of the corner guest room. This photo was taken in 1966 by the well-known architectural photographer Richard Nickel, one of the individuals who saved the Glessner house that year. You can see Nickel's reflection in the mirror over the sink as he snaps the picture. One of the interesting things revealed in this photo is the replacement toilet. Originally, all of the toilets had high tanks, known as cisterns. At some point, the fixture in this room was replaced with a more traditional low tank toilet. Both the seat and the tank were made of wood. One space that survived relatively intact is the washroom in the courtyard guest room, usually occupied by female guests. As the name suggests, the room only contains a sink for washing up, its original tile backsplash still intact, surrounded by oak trim. For functions other than washing, the guest would go down the hall and share the full bathroom with the Glessner's daughter, Fanny. The faucet for this sink is believed to be original and appears identical to the one visible in the photo of George's bathroom. Many sinks of the period had separate faucets for hot and cold water. This one was far more convenient as it combined hot and cold into a single faucet. The sink itself dates to the Glessner period, but is not original, as it is marked with a patent date of 1902 on the underside of the bowl. One bathroom in the house has been fully restored, the small guest bathroom under the staircase in the main hall. The bathroom had been remodeled in the early 1970s with a huge wall mirror, bar light above, and a massive Formica counter that crowded the toilet. Restoration of this room was undertaken in 2014. Elements of the restoration included replastering, replacing the missing wood wainscoting, installing a period sconce in its original location, and sourcing period appropriate fixtures. The small sink, known as a cloakroom sink, is a copy of a design by Thomas Crapper and Company, one of the earliest manufacturers of plumbing fixtures in England. One of the interesting finds during the restoration was the ghost of the original mirror, revealed when the huge 1970s mirror was taken down. At some point after the Glessners died, the mirror was removed and the room was wallpapered as seen by the design in the middle of this image. The mirror was returned to the wall and was left in place when the entire room was later painted white. It probably remained in place until the early 1970s remodeling. The distinctive shape of the mirror, outlined in white paint, proved to match exactly a mirror that for decades hung over the location of the shaving sink in John Glessner's dressing room. During the restoration, it was removed and returned to its original location where it can be seen today. The toilet bowl is an early 20th century original sourced from a company in California. The tank is oak and would have originally been lined with lead or copper. 
it now has a plastic insert with modern mechanics. If you look closely at the middle of the tank, you can see the small rubber button positioned to prevent the lid from hitting the wood tank when it was put up. The original wood cistern with lead lining was set atop iron brackets and was still in place in the guest bathroom, revealing the name of the manufacturer, Meyer Sniffen, and the patent date of 1883. The original pull chain was also in place and still operated the mechanism inside, although water had obviously long since been turned off. The framing on the wall showed the size and shape of the enclosure that had originally concealed the cistern. A new enclosure was designed and built, using the one visible in the photo of George's bathroom as a guide. There are small gaps in between each wood slat to provide air circulation, thus preventing the moisture from the standing water in the cistern from rotting the wood. The only difference with the new enclosure is that a small window was built into the front so that the Meyer Sniffen name and patent date could be seen. The 1948 photo of the Glessner's bathroom showed the shape of the original pole on the overhead cistern chain. An exhaustive search uncovered a similar vintage oak pole in England, which was obtained and installed. In the historic image at left, you can see a small notch on each side of the pole. This shows where the missing rubber bumper would have been, as can be seen in the image at right. As the chain was long, it would swing, and the rubber bumper would prevent the pole from damaging the wall. The original building specifications called for the use of Knoxville marble under the toilets in the rooms that had wood floors. Knoxville marble is actually a type of limestone quarried in eastern Tennessee, known for its pinkish gray color. The top surface of the slab has a recessed channel running around three sides of the base of the toilet to collect condensation. The slab was missing and was replicated during the restoration. No discussion of bathrooms would be complete without addressing the history of toilet tissue, itself a topic that could fill several secrets videos. Have you ever really considered toilet tissue? Probably not, unless perhaps you suddenly run out, or were caught in the mad rush for the valuable commodity at the start of the pandemic in 2020, but I digress. The 1948 image of the Glessner's bathroom shows folded sheets of tissue sitting on the edge of the foot bath next to the toilet. This is a reminder of what the Glessners would have known early on, individual paper squares that came in boxes or bundles. Toilet tissue on a roll was unknown when they completed their house in 1887. We did, however, opt to install an early 20th century toilet tissue holder in the guest bathroom, as seen on the right. After all, one can only go so far in being historically correct. It was not until 1890 that brothers Irvin and Clarence Scott began putting toilet tissue on rolls, which were sold in individual packages through pharmacies. The product was not originally marketed under the Scott name, as they didn't wish to associate their name with this unmentionable product. So it was sold under numerous different brand names. It was Irvin's son, Arthur, who later made Scott Tissue a household name, marketing it as a health-promoting product and coining their first effective slogan, soft as old linen. Patents were awarded for various advancements in both the toilet tissue and its dispensers, such as the one seen on the right issued to Seth Wheeler in 1891. And if you look carefully, you will note that the controversy which has deeply divided our country for more than a century is easily resolved. Over, not under. One item found in the Glessner's bathroom has miraculously survived for well over a century, the wooden bath thermometer. Dr. Forbes' specifications along the side of the thermometer noted the temperatures ranging from 32 to 105 degrees, designated as freezing, cold, cool, temperate, tepid, warm, and hot. Thermometers such as this were advertised in the Montgomery Ward and Company catalog of 1895 for just 48 cents. 
The thermometer was left in the house after the Glessners died. When the Lithographic Technical Foundation moved out in the 1960s, a longtime employee took it as a keepsake, and keep it he did. In 2019, his two daughters returned it to the house, although, ironically, the bathtub itself is long gone. We hope you have enjoyed learning more about the bathrooms at Glessner House and how valuable clues in the two known photographs have informed the restoration and interpretation of these spaces. Tune in next time when another secret will be revealed.